<laughs> well, this is going to be a squeaky greeting. <laughs> um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to read from uh, my book, The Birds of Opulence, and the second chapter was actually published in the Oxford American as a standalone short story. So I'm going to read the the end of that and hope that you can kind of get it. And I, it doesn't hurt. It just sounds like it hurts. So I apologize for my voice. Um, so I think that you'll be able to catch up if you just uh, know that this is an intergenerational story. So there is a um, a great a great grandmother whose name is. Mama Minnie, uh, or Minnie Mae. There is a grandmother whose name is Tuki. Um, the daughter's name is Lucy. There is a child that has just been born out in the squash patch. Um, there was a, 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 an, a, that child has an older brother whose name is Kevin and they call him Kiki. And the husband's name is Joe Brown. And Joe Brown has moved to Opulence, Kentucky from, uh, from the city. Um, and by city here, we're talking about, you know, the big city of Lexington uh, <laughs> and not Opulence, Kentucky. Um, and part of what this book is about is mental illness. So I guess since I'm reading just the end, uh, listen for, uh, there's a lot of characters, but keep in mind uh, Lucy's story and listen for her. So. Um, this is a family that's well known in this community and the little section that I'm going to read. So it's 1962 and this baby's been born out in a squash patch, which even then was sort of rare. Um, so this family, which is kind of a prominent uh, family in town uh, in both sort of an infamous uh, family as far as what's going on there, is uh, opened up their doors to the community. So that's the section that you're going to hear. Uh, they're kind of having a, an introduction, a pre presentation of this baby. When company arrives a few days later, Minnie Mae in her church pearls and a touch of wine red lipstick posts herself in a wingback chair beside the front door. She kisses some of the women on the cheek, grasps the hands of others. She eyeballs some, but greets them politely and directs each woman toward Lucy who is sitting almost motionless in a rocking chair across the room. Get yourself some lemonade and go on that back, she says to the children. In the kitchen, she says to the men and nods her head in the kitchen's direction. Outside, this night hangs like a cloak, hot and moist enough to wring out like a wet tea towel. The rain has stopped for now and the heat causes steam to rise from the ground like smoke. A sliver of moon glows through the clouds. Lucy is at the far end of the living room, almost sullen in the rocking chair, holding the baby in a receiving blanket. Tookie stands behind Lucy with her arms, keeping the chair from rocking, keeping Lucy and the new baby safe. She says nothing but nods once or twice as the, woman, the women come one by one. Pretty little thing. Law me, look at that. What a boat from the blue, they say. Would you name her? Tookie holds the back of the chair, more peaceful behind her shield. If she looks them in the eye for too long, 1943 comes humming back. She's a long-necked girl again in her belly, six months swollen, cast out of the church choir, told she can't talk to her friends. Shame washes over her still. Back over Tookie's left shoulder, through the haze of insects drawn to the porch light, Kevin is playing in the yard. He has been joined by one of the Jenkins boys, and they are running around the poles of the clothesline. Children turn noisy at the sight of dessert and are quickly shooed out into the backyard by their mothers. Girls go wide-eyed at the baby. Boys sneak extra cookies or a paper cup of lemonade and clack the back screen door behind them. Lucy rocks the baby, answers the same question a blue million times, hears men's voices ebb and flow in the kitchen. The house is alive with sound. She grins when she hears Joe's words rise and fall in the talking. Go fishing for long. No, not all night. I know you're right, man. I'm telling you. Girl, how'd you do it? 
How you survived that field, women her age ask. Some of them she hasn't seen since high school. Woman always does what she has to. Lucy finds a chortle somewhere inside her to make light, but even while she's thrown her head back, it sounds to her like some other woman's laugh rising up out of her chest. She places a hand on her throat just to be sure. Where's that man of yours done run off to? One of them finally asks. He ain't run no further than the kitchen, Lucy says, and cocks her head to listen to the men. Ah, there it is. Joe's voice soothing her, even far off like that, rising up and going down low out there in the kitchen. Lucy thinks of Joe's deep laugh, his tender whisper in her ear, the deep growl of his snoring. Her hand a little shaky, Tookie steps forward and takes the baby clothes, bottles, and pink wrapped gifts from visitors and places them on the coffee table. She refills the lemonade and piles more sugar cookies on a serving platter before she returns to safety behind the rocking chair. Some of the women stare, Lucy and the rocker holding that baby and looking off into the air at nothing in particular, and Tookie with her hands gripped tightly to the back of that chair and her head dropping every time anybody tries to catch her glance. It's an odd sight. Both doors have been opened wide opened enough times that the flies are starting to settle in the house. Two of them are taking turns landing on the baby's cheeks and eyes. Others are swarming around the pie. A yellow jacket buzzes through the living room and gnats fly around the lemonade. One hums in Lucy's ear. She turns her head but doesn't even swat at it. A fly lands on the baby again, feasting on the corner of her eye. The baby blinks. Lucy just watches the fly, rubbing its front legs together, its tiny, hungry tongue. Tookie reaches in and shoes it from the baby's head. The fan in the corner of the living room blows hot air around. A few more men have joined the others huddled in the kitchen, where they find Joe Brown on the floor under the table repairing a robbly leg. Congratulations, put her there, one man says, pulling Joe to his feet and shaking his head, his hand. She done dragged me over here. You know how the women are, another says. How you doing, Joe? Man, you getting any sleep? Joe Brown shakes his head, swipes his brow and his neck. You know how the women are, he thinks. The men are still talking and laughing, but Joe isn't listening fully. He wants to answer back, no, I sure as hell don't know how the women are. But he knows the man wasn't expecting a real answer. <laughs> men pat him on his sweaty back. His silver tongue beginnings are almost forgotten. They nod at each other with this thought in their minds. It's only when he talks fast or calls up some city-fied story that they remember where he's from. After everyone has had a bite to eat, Mama Minnie taps her cane against the floor three times. The room quiets and she walks into the center like a preacher woman and says, God sure does make a way, don't he? Sister Betty shouts amen and everyone claps. We sure do feel blessed to have her, Mama Minnie points to the baby, and blessed to have so many of the Lord's servants with us here today. She bows and then says, thank you, Jesus, and looks up at the crowd. One of the younger women whispers to the others and they cover their mouths. People applaud again, and a few boys who've come back for more food whistle through their fingers. One of the men pulls his tall, lanky boy into the kitchen by the arm and begs to whip him in front of everybody if he doesn't stop. A few of the women look to see if Lucy will address the group, but when she lowers her head toward the baby, the room turns noisy again. People continue milling around the house, talking among themselves, drinking every last drop of lemonade, eating every cookie, every last damn peanut. When the baby begins to cry, her tiny mouth bowing out into a perfect thimble, a few women turn and smile, tilt their heads to the side, one of them says with delight, ain't that the cutest thing you ever did see? But when the baby reaches a full soft cry, Lucy begins a howl. Tookie rubs her shoulders, but she is inconsolable. Joe comes from the kitchen, kneels down beside the chair. Baby, are you all right? Lucy's lips are quivering, her chest heaving. She lets out a moan, cries harder, and gasps for breath. She does not stop. The crowd is now quiet again. Some of the women admire Joe's hand on Lucy's leg and feel the imaginary weight of a man's hand on their own knees. Others are whispering among themselves, crazy heifer, well if that don't beat all. Lucy rocks back and forth in the chair. 
Tookie reaches in to take the baby. Joe strokes Lucy's knee like a man who doesn't know what else to do. But before he can intervene, before Tookie can pull the baby safely into her own arms, before Mama Minnie can cross the room, the baby rolls from Lucy's lap, rolls like a clamp can of lard, like a wad of fabric or a cumbersome quilt, like a rolling pin or a small sack of new potatoes, and makes a light thud on the plank floor like something being cast away. There is one wide-eyed look on every face in the room, a great communal hush rises up and for a few seconds no one says a word. And all attention turns to Tookie who falls to her knees, scoops the baby into her arms and then almost topples head first when she tries to get back to her feet. A few women grab the hands of their children, lower their heads and leave quietly. When the front door flies open and people start to step off the porch, Mama Minnie sees a large woman from church, Francine Clark, standing at the edge of the yard holding a Pryrex dish. Francine steals a nervous glance toward Mama Minnie, then nods to her and turns back toward the road without coming in, without leaving what she brought. Mama Minnie, who still has one ear on the commotion but her eye on Francine Clark, follows her wide hips down the worn path in the grass and even in the midst of all the chaos says aloud to herself, something always been funny about that woman. Afraid she might be hurt, Tookie pulls back the blanket and runs her fingers across the baby's head in search of lumps, looks for bruises. The baby stops crying. Kevin watches his mother and watches the remaining neighbors watching his mother. Mama, he hollers out, but Lucy acts as if she doesn't hear him. She ignores him. She buries her eyes in her hands and bites her lip. The tears are streaming down her face and dripping off her chin. Let me get you back to bed, Joe says, and the women are hushed again by the love in his voice. Lucy raises her head and for a moment her face is so twisted and puffy that Joe barely recognizes her. She stands and leans into Joe. He leads her through the maze of onlookers to their bedroom where he places her in the bed and pulls a sheet up over her. Nobody speaks a word until Mama Minnie says, here y'all get some of this caramel cake before you leave. And Tookie, with the baby still pressed against her, rushes over to help wrap pieces of cake in tin foil with her free hand. As everyone leaves, a clap of thunder sounds in the distance and they scatter toward their homes. Rain pours out in buckets. Elders return to their front porches. Children search for June bugs. Whippoorwills serenade a young couple who dared to make love up against the roughness of a tool shed way out in the dark. Somewhere a dog barks for a child to come back out to play. But the baby, this Yolanda, born in the field in the old way, and her mother, Lucy Good Brown, a plum crazy woman, are never far from every lip. And poor Joe Brown, she's lucky to sin to have him, wonder if he don't pack up and leave. On this night, and for a long time to come, every tongue stirs. Inside the Good House, Mama Minnie opens up her Bible, thinking of a few soothing words to say, then just as quick, she decides to keep them to herself until morning. She reads Psalms 46. She prays before settling into bed. Girl just needs her time, she thinks. Her mind drifts back to that Clark woman out in the yard, big old body balanced on them little feet, holding her dish and not saying a word like she didn't have a lick of sense. Tookie stares at the ceiling in her own bedroom presses the nubby surface of her bedspread, then smooths it out with her fingers. She repeats this until she has pressed some of the worry out, a tiny moment of respite before worry comes back. Something bad didn't come over her child, she thinks. Kevin gets into his red pajamas by himself. He kisses his mother and his brand new sister before going to, to his room, wishes he could sleep with him. Sleep tight, little man, his father says. Good night, little Kevin. His mother says nothing. Lucy and Joe spoon against one another, the baby curled against her mother's breast. By the time the house rests, Mama Minnie has already left her burden of the day and tied up her hair and is under her sheet snoring. Everyone is asleep when Lucy cries again. Her tears come as easy as breath. She touches the child's face as it nurses and then pinches the baby's nostrils together. She does this as she feels Joe nestled against her back. How simple life is. Silly how it works, really. 
She could starve the child of air, and even Joe, who was snoring gently in her ear, would never know. She watches her daughter struggle for breath, watches her bright eyes widen until the legs kick and she lets go of a nipple. Lucy does it again until she can feel the baby trying to fling her head free. Then she releases and listens to her child settle into being able to breathe again, a hurried in and out, in, out. She listens for a long time, only the teeniest bit of panic rising in her until the baby's breath is in rhythm with her own again. In truth, Lucy can hear the breathing of the entire house, the out, the in, out, in. They are loud, one big choir singing out survival in the night. Her eyes race around the room. She can smell the wildness of her own milk. Thank you. Mm -hmm.